Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce to you now. Andy Taylor is an accredited coach through the United Kingdom Strength and Conditioning Association. Andy has a wealth of experience in planning and periodization of working pro training programs, nutritional advice, and performance analysis of specific sports. Andy was a professional footballer for nearly 10 years and began his playing career in 1996 at Manchester United Football Club, where he gained a professional contract in the year 2000. This was unfortunately cut short due to a career-threatening injury. Through his experiences, Andy has developed a thorough understanding of the requirements of being a top athlete. He has also experienced the lows of injuries and therefore can empathize with anyone who suffers with one. He feels a great sense of responsibility in the work he does to provide effective strength and conditioning, which can aid in the prevention of injuries and the potential to maximize performance. And he has also completed professional training in low carbohydrate, healthy fat, ketogenic nutrition treatment, as well as nutrition network advisor training. His knowledge and skills offer his clients support for their variety of goals, such as improving their overall health or their overall athletic performance. Andy Taylor, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you to Boundless Body Radio. Thanks very much for having me, Casey. I'm really uh, proud to be here. So thanks uh, for having me on. It's an honor to host you. We've been uh, talking about this for a little while now, so it's great to get you on. This is actually really good timing. I want to clarify in the introduction, I said you're a footballer. That, that is English speak that's not american <laughs> yeah. speak you did not play <laughs> yeah. american english i hope most people would know that and at this point when somebody hears the date 1996 2000 manchester united a lot of us have now seen this amazing documentary all about beckham and a lot of people yeah. might be familiar with the team especially around that time that's an amazing thing to be a part of and you were there at, around the same time when the club was doing so great and his you know, his role as an athlete and superstar was just going through the stratosphere. What was that like? It, well, completely unbelievable for for me um, as a as a young fourteen year old as when I first signed for them, uh, and a, and a Manchester United fan as well. Um, I I was at Tottenham Hotspur before that, and as a thirteen year old, and from where I live, I'm miles away from these big football clubs. So um, it's a, it's difficult to kind of make it to uh, a big club like that in the first place. So having the opportunity to go to Manchester United, who I supported, there was only one club I was ever going to leave Tottenham Hotspur for. And Tottenham was a great club. Um, but the opportunity to go there was just too big an opportunity to turn down. Um, and I just can remember turning up there the the first time for for training and seeing these stars who I idolized at the time and just wish that all my friends could kind of see what I could see I, I wish I had like a video camera with me to kind of take it all in and um because it was it was like a dream it really was um uh, but an amazing experience to be around that football club at that time you had the class of 92 which um Beckham was part of and these young players that had come into this team where they kind of been written off at first, but just took the league by storm and just really showed how good they were, how talented a group of young players. And, and Manchester United has such a rich history of, of young uh, aspiring players from the sixties and the Busby babes. It's just such a tradition of the, of the football club. Um, it was, yeah, an amazing time and, 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 and rich part of their history uh, at that particular time, they were just so so dominant, so dominant um, in the domestic league, but also obviously the the Champions League as well, which is the big one for you know European clubs to to go and win. So yeah, um, unbelievable experience. That's that's amazing. Um, I thought the documentary was. Fan have you seen the documentary? By the way, mm, I have. Yes. Yeah. Yep. I thought I've seen was... the Beckham one and the class of ninety two. So so oh, well, all the all the the, tre the treble season. So it documents. The, the young players coming into team and then what they had to go through to, to win the treble. So the 1999 season. So it documents that season where they, they won the league, the FA cup and the champions league all in, all in one season, which was a, a great achievement. 
Wow, that's crazy. The, the documentary was cool showing, you know, Beckham growing up. He obviously idolized the club as well. So what an amazing opportunity to uh, play for the team that you you follow. But I really liked that the whole documentary was not just about him. They showed a lot of teammates, what, the, what was going on with the team. Like you got to see quite a bit, obviously not as much as you were able to see, but you got to know a sense of like the teams and the coaches and personalities. And like there was a lot going on then. Um, very fascinating. I thought it was great. Oh yeah, it, um, there there was a lot going, and it's interesting to kind of see that from the players' point of view of how they felt that that was, um, or, or what they saw in in David Beckham and how it may be affecting him at the time, what he was dealing with, particularly after the '98 World Cup when he got sent off, and he had, you know, just and to be around the club and see some of that was incredible to see, but just highlights his mindset of being able to overcome the abuse that he got at that particular time oh and God. still perform, which is is, a, is amazing credit to him um, and his, his ability to just focus on, um, on his job and his role uh, at the football club and, and perform as a professional athlete. It was, yeah, it's fascinating time. It seems more likely that he would have been beheaded by guillotine with the rage that the country erupted on him and and i understand why and it's a country where there's so much passion (laughs) around it but oh my goodness to power through any of that i would have just i would have left the country and moved to south africa and never talked to anybody ever again so huge yeah compliment to him like you said to be able to remain competitive Uh, absolutely and and um and many people kind of thought at the time that he was he would he would leave and he would go somewhere else um but to the fact to kind of stick that out and overcome it uh, and win the whole nation around, you know, in terms of captain in the the national team and being idolized and people kind of cheering him on, you know, really showed the the quality of of player that he was, um, and to score vital goals at, at certain times to get us to big competitions, uh, which I was lucky enough to see. I remember the Greece one at Old Trafford, the the, the free kick, like in the final seconds of the game, uh, that was an unbelievable unbelievable moment to to see and be part of it was it was brilliant that's crazy okay going back to that time you know we're talking about like the 90s early 2000s what was the mentality around strength conditioning and even nutrition i i'm guessing there was probably nothing that was told you guys as far as like nutrition went but i mean you're talking like this is the arguably the best professional team in any sport in the world what was the strength and conditioning and even again like the nutritional environment at the time uh, so the nutritional environment at the time so we were based at the the training ground so we were at the very um old training ground the cliff originally at the start of 99 and the new training ground was just being finished so actually halfway through that that season we transitioned over to the new training ground there was a nutritionist um at the club that was based mainly with the first team would work with the reserves. And then he would kind of do some little bits with us as the youth team players at at that, at that particular time in terms of kind of the, the the catering that was improved by moving to the new facility, um, the whole canteen and things like that, very much kind of based around um, carbohydrates and being able to kind of fuel you for your your training and these types of things. So there was there was kind of some input in that. Um, we would have some kind of body fat analysis from time to time in measuring that, and um, it in terms of the strength and conditioning. I'm oh, sorry, I was just trying to remember the second part of that question. The strength and conditioning that only just started to come in at that that particular time in sort of two two thousands, and it was actually one of the dads of one of the players um, who was in my age group, but also his bro- older brother was in the reserves at the time, Michael Clegg, and it was their dad Mick Clegg that ran his own gym that was um, was approached by the the football club about starting to do some kind of strength development work now his background was all around olympic lifting all three of his children had been um champions in the uk for for weightlifting so he'd been 
quite a successful coach in that, ran his own gym. And that was the first person that was kind of approached to sort of start to bring in some kind of strength and conditioning structure to um, the football club or into football. And football is, is always quite far behind other sports in terms of bringing new innovation in. Although Manchester United was very innovative, which is probably why they were the first one to start to go down that route. I mean, we even had um, a lady that used to come in and she was an optometrist, I think is the word for it. And she would do work with you on kind of eye tracking and peripheral vision. No one else was, no other club was doing anything like that. Um, so the manager, Alex Ferguson, was was very innovative, um, always looking to try to look at new ways of, of developing the training um, and improving the players beyond just the technical um, skills that they had. So we were right. At, I was right at the very start of that kind of coming into football. Uh, so that probably had a, um, uh, a bearing on, on me and my future uh, career on top of dealing with injuries at, at that particular time as well. And I think those two things probably really steered me towards wanting to um, kind of go into that as, as a career. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm, I'm guessing the resistance around strength training and a, a sport like soccer, especially at the time, you know, we're talking 24, 25 years ago, is that yeah. why would I want to do any strength training? I might get bulky. And that's the exact last thing that a, that a footballer would want. Is that is that kind yeah. of the thinking around that? Yeah, it was a lot of the kind of holdback for, for players. And, and even, even like now, there is still <laughs> that that kind of feeling, uh, that, that kind of paradigm that still hangs around um, without that kind of understanding of, of what you're trying to develop. And that's where Mike uh, Mick Clegg was actually very good because he um, knew where the players were coming from. He had two boys that were footballers as well, so was very um, clued into their needs uh, and developed those boys into being fast and explosive and strong players. And that was really their, their advantage as players. Technically, they were, they were still good, but probably not techni as technical as other players. But because of their physical abilities, they, they were at one of the best, if not the best club in the world. So it kind of showcased by working on certain aspects of your physical capabilities that that could be beneficial for you as as an athlete, um, and and he was he was very um, he did a really good job of just kind of gently building that into um, being part of the environment that that developed over the over the coming years, and, and he had a really great relationship with Cristiano Ronaldo, and you just need mm -hmm. to see what type of athlete he is. And he and and Mike did a lot of work in trying to uh, and helping him develop as a as he as a younger professional player. So, um, yeah, had had a lot of expertise. Um, Amazing. And, and 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 also built in to some of the work that he did with things that the players really enjoyed. So he did a lot of kind of boxing work and reactive work, and the players really kind of got involved with a bit competition and boxing and things like that. So he, he did very well at trying to kind of mix those two things of trying to develop certain key aspects, but also bringing in, you know, being reactive is also really good, but doing it in a way that he knew the players would kind of buy into. So um, he, he did a great job. That's, that's a nugget of gold for any coaches out there. It's like, you may think you've got the best program and the best protocol, and maybe you do, but if your clients don't enjoy what they're doing, they're not going to be able to do it. So I love that you threw that in there. I could not. Um, Mike's, Mike's actually um, got a, a book out um, and documents or his, his kind of early life, but also a lot of the work that he did at Manchester United. Um, and it's, it's, it's fascinating to kind of read um, his stories that when I was there at the time I could resonate with, but also like the things that happened as well when I, I left. So um, yeah, it's, it's, if, if anyone's kind of interested in, in that kind of story, his book is, is a, is a, is a really good read. 
Oh, fantastic. That's great. Um, we mentioned in the introduction, your injury that you suffered um, as you were playing professionally. Um, so, so hindsight, looking back now, knowing everything that you know now, especially about rehabilitation, and I would argue even uh, injury prevention, prehabilitation, as it's sometimes called, what yep. things you, from where you are today, what things would you have done differently had you known them 25 years ago? Uh, there would definitely be a physical development aspect of my training that I would have been doing. Um, my training as a young child was all around playing football constantly. Um, coming back from school, going straight out, not coming back until it was time to go to bed uh, in the holiday times like we are in now in the summer holidays. It would be get up in the morning, out for the whole day. You might kind of call in on on a, at a friend's house you were closest to for a little bit of lunch and then you were back out again and then not getting home until tea, it was tea time. Um, and it was just that constantly, um, which was a great childhood, um, but with no kind of consideration of kind of how much you were doing. And because you were a, a good player, you would play for your school, your county, your club team. Then you would play for, you know, then I would travel to Manchester and play for Manchester United. And then the next weekend I'd play for my local club. And then in the week I'd play oh, a, a, another county game. So those games would kind of rack up. So, yeah, having some kind of consideration about the workload that, um, that you do as a, as a, as a child. Um, but also the nutrition as well. Um, yeah. And kind of when I look back, at um my nutrition and particularly with my injury because it was um on the surface of the femur in in the knee we know now that kind of a high sugar diet can be effective to uh to the joint surface so i don't know that for sure but that could potentially um, and certainly as, as things developed me for me, as I got into my early thirties and then started to kind of notice certain aspects of metabolic syndrome, then maybe for me personally, uh, I was susceptible to kind of glucose intolerance and yeah. that may have affected it on top of, you know, the, the workload that I did as a, as a child as well. Um, so yeah, having some kind of physical development were alongside it. And that's really why I love what I've done over the last 15, 16 years working in a school, but also the work that I do in my own business and particularly working with, um, young athletes and giving them that framework and that long-term physical development. And we call yeah. it like, you know, turning a physical or your physical literacy into a physical legacy. And mm. yeah, that's that's very poignant for me from yeah my own experiences of that really amazing and so your transition was basically from your professional career you pretty much started um coaching immediately after that right with young athletes and also um you know other people to kind of maximize performance and in the beginning it wasn't very much related to nutrition correct it was more around the strength training yeah. um you know developing protocols to help get people strong um what yeah. was that experience like doing the coaching in the very beginning when you felt like you were helping people get strong and, and be more resilient against injury yeah, uh, uh, amazing. Because when when I finished playing a full time professionally, because when I left Manchester United, I actually came back home to Exeter, um, back down in Devon, and I and then I went and played for Exeter for another five years. So I had I actually managed to cut, kind of eke out another professional football career for a little bit of time, and strangely enough, ended up playing against Manchester United in the FA Cup in the third round, which was That's right. Just a crazy experience. Oh, but when that kind of came to when that came to an end, and I was 27 around that time, I knew what I wanted to do. But I've met my wife and she worked in professional football as well. Um, and we had this idea that we wanted to be able to offer that same support that an athlete or a footballer gets in a, in in our experience, and that that whole support through that rehab process. So they have an injury or they've had an operation. And then they've got all their kind of treatment and then early stage rehab and then that development process all the way through and to offer that to the general public because the general public just 
do not get that support. And that was our experience that they get a certain bit up right at the beginning and then they're kind of left. And then that person is just full of questions of what do I do? How much do I do? Um, and what is the right thing to do? And that's what, what we want to really help people and guide people to give them the right thing so that they can get back to the things that they really want to do, whatever that might be. Um, yeah. So th that was kind of key for us in the beginning. And and I was very fortunate enough in, this, in the start um, that uh, the, the manager of the football club that I was playing with part-time at the time when I was going through my degree um, – worked at a school and he had told me that they were looking for someone to like set up an af athlete development program um because they they had it with a couple of sports but they were expanding the support of the sports across the the whole school so uh i managed to get that role and that started and it was a great um learning environment for me to put what I was learning in my degree straight into practice with people right in front of me. So having that opportunity to work with uh, young children, uh, older children, because it went from uh, 11 years old through to 18. And then we also started a primary program. So we had children kind of seven and eight coming up to the school from their local primaries and then running a program to, to develop them even before they came to us at secondary school age at 11 years old. And so we had the opportunity then to kind of create this long-term, real long-term uh, youth athlete development program. So we could just help support them alongside their technical uh, sessions that they were doing both outside of school, but also in school as well, because we had coaches to support the the technical um, work in, in their particular sports. So um, it, it was, it was a, a brilliant brilliant place for me to to really learn my craft yeah i mean i'm thinking about like a personal training career where yeah you can get certified as a physio or personal trainer depending on where you are like call it but it's not like you start day one and you've got a book full of clients so no. that was a cool opportunity to get to yeah. practice what you were learning right in the beginning um as far as physical fitness training um, my kind of opinion has changed on this quite a bit, but one of the things I remember learning early on is that kids shouldn't be doing any type of strength training in particular, like weightlifting. Um, what do you, what have you kind of learned with your experience as far as kids and doing any form of like strength training? Is it unsafe? Does it stunt their growth? Like I hear rumors about this kind of stuff all the time yet. Like I'll, I'll, I'll hear that strength training or isn't good, but then I go see kids in parking or in playgrounds. They're basically doing push-ups and pull-ups and all kinds of stuff. So I, yeah. I don't know where the line is distinguished. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's 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 consensus statements that have been brought up now, uh, brought out by uh, the UKSA here in the UK. I think Avery Fagenbaum in the in the US has been really. Um, uh, a great resource of the the research into children's uh, athletic development, um, and there's there's no um, stunting of growth. That is a complete fallacy. Um, children should not do um, a downsized adult program, but they should be doing. Uh, an athlete development program and that is things to be able to do locomotor skills being able to run jump skip slide roll uh, land absorb force and build that up in it on a progressive journey you you it, it's like learning any school skill for a child like learning to read you wouldn't get them to try to just read a book straight away they have to learn the letters they have to learn how that go, f flows into a sentence, into a paragraph, into uh, then into that full full uh, story, and the same process with that physical uh, literacy journey to wow. um, develop those skills and build one. What and and if they've got strength through full ranges, so they can get into movements and postures, then at that point. Yeah, then you can, to the, the next challenge is, can they do that under a little bit of load? It doesn't mean that you're going to put 
50 kilos straight on their back. They learn uh, the movements first. They get efficient at those movements. And then we challenge those movements. And we can challenge that in, in, in different ways, in time and space. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be under load, but at, cer at a certain point, some additional load needs to be added. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, and I can think do that's that. It's got to be progressive. I that sounds perfectly reasonable. I see no problem with any of that at all. And that's just seems super helpful for, again, like if you're, if long, you're thinking long-term, you want this kid, it, whether or not he's going to be professional or not to um, have as long of a career or as long as a, as a life, you know, living healthily and moving the way that they want to. So yeah, that, that sounds perfectly reasonable to me. Um, I also had a question about sports specific training. I have to admit, I do, my, my mind has changed mostly about this where, where I was trained like if somebody's a hockey player, their training program is vastly, vastly different than somebody who's a soccer player than somebody who's a tennis player. And I still agree that there need to be differences, but I also tend to kind of think that the gym should be used for creating strength and mobility and whatever. And then that the, the, the person, the client should then go out and practice their sport in the context that the sport is practiced at. That said, obviously, I think you can change programs and do things that people like, but what has been where do you where do you fall on that kind of idea of like sports specific training versus more like generalized let's get you really strong kind of training for any activity that you do yeah i mean there, there's a lot of commonalities uh, uh, across sports aren't there so yeah i mean the what you use for one sport you're going to use for for another um but if you if you look at things like like a sport like football and rugby well rugby certainly need a lot more upper body strength and they need to look after their shoulders a lot more than, say, a footballer does. So, but in terms of kind of change of direction and having strength and speed and and build power through their legs to to change direction, then there's that's a, that's pretty much the same for those two sports. So, yes, there, there's commonality, but there also are specific things that you need to work on for a particular sport over over another one. So it's it's just looking up at what uh, what are the movements? What are the needs for for that player? What are the needs for their position uh, as well? Um, because uh, uh, in rugby, for example, a back will look very different to a forward player in terms of size and um, and that kind of thing. So, yeah, the, you 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 look you will do a needs analysis of 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 what the sport needs and then kind of base your exercise selection a little bit off off that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I really appreciate that. Um, you mentioned early in your career, you know, the, the, the foods you were told to eat or the same foods I was told to eat if you were, you know, even at, at a, a, you know, an amateur level, if you're interested in nutrition or cycling, for example, it's a very high carbohydrate diet, which is what yeah. all of us did. Um, tell us about your journey with nutrition. Um, again, it sounds like you weren't taught a lot. You were able to access food while you were with a professional team, but it was kind of whatever they provided. Um, mm. When when did you start to make nutrition part of what you were interested in that eventually led you to really unconventional ways of using nutrition, especially with, with athletes? Yeah. Um, just reflecting back on what it was like when I was playing, um, I remember making up my own kind of glucose drinks and I, and I looked this up only the other day um, and it used to be a 50 gram serving that I would have before I would train. I'd have a 50 gram serving during and I'd have, have a double serving because that was the dosage that it, that it would say to replenish your stores after. So that was 200 grams just from training, and that was every day. Oh my goodness! On top that, and that was before what I would eat, and I would be eating things like pasta and rice because I, you know, I need to recover for the next day's training, or I would really carb load on the Friday night because I had a game the next day on the Saturday, so that would be double again. And so, there's <laughs> it. It makes me smile, but. Um, it, there's no wonder why when I hit my mid thirties, that actually things start to go awry a little bit. Um, and that's when it really, and actually thinking about when I was back playing that always probably carried a little bit more weight than I felt my training, um, 
really accounted for. I felt that I should be in better condition than than, and I looked around at other other players that didn't work as hard as I did, and they were probably in better condition than me. So that that started to make sense when I started to learn a little bit more um, with investigating why I didn't feel great in my mid thirties. And, and as I started to understand what metabolic syndrome was and insulin resistance through the nutrition network courses, that really uh, lit a bulb for me um, in terms of kind of understanding and, and kind of filled in a lot of the unanswered questions over, a, over a number of years. So I, I, and I think when you find something for yourself, you want to kind of help everyone else don't you um, yeah absolutely and, and you you want to try to kind of in, impart some of that knowledge because i'm not the only one that's feeling that way uh and and having those kind of issues so uh, and i meet those people every day so having some answers for them now makes the work that i do from trying to optimize people's health beyond just the the strength development work that that we want to do with them really able to optimize their health so that they can live as a fulfilled optimal life as possible which is what we all want it's what i want and certainly i want to be able to you know um optimize my time and particularly with with my family and my children and my wife yeah yeah i love that it's such a nice edge in the beginning when you're trying to seek answers you know, for your own health in particular, like I think back to the nutrition certification that I got when I wanted to get certified and, you know, yeah. it's promoting a lot of whole grains and fruits and vegetables and leaner cuts of protein. And, yeah. and if you, if you put, if you get the wrong information, it can set you down a path where you may or may not ever recover from, or you might feel like very similar to what you said. I love the way you said, like for all the training I was doing, I felt like I should have like looked a little bit better or felt a little bit better. You hear that all the time. People start a running program and they're like, well, I'm running all the time. Why am I not losing any weight? This doesn't make any sense. I should look a little different. Um, yeah. But, but, but again, if you get the wrong information, it can send you down the wrong path for quite a while. That might be hard to recover from. What, do you remember some of the sources of information that you were going to that were teaching you about insulin resistance and metabolic syndromes and eventually led to kind of a low carbohydrate style of eating? Yeah. So it was all, all through the nutrition network. Um, so through the Noakes foundation. So Tim Noakes was just um, the, the first person that I, I came across uh, that really started to answer a lot of questions for me uh and and listening to to some of the some of his talks and then uh coming across the nutrition network courses which then you know being able to kind of access rob sivers zoe harkham um Ivor cummins um and and the, these people kind of highlight in this this information that just isn't out there frankly made me quite angry to start with um and but really empowered me to be able to go and, and do something first good for myself, but also for, for the people that I get to work with. And, and so that's been transformational for me, um, given me that understanding uh, so that I can then relay that information to the, to the people that are in front of me. Amazing. So with your personal journey, how, in what ways was it transformational for you? Uh, so much better, um, energy levels, mood state, uh, outlook on life, improved body composition, um, and just a totally happier person. Wow. So yeah it's had it's had a profound effect on me um and and i'm sure help to have a profound effect on the people that i get to work with from being yeah. in that state yeah you and i were talking offline before we logged on here and like you go to you know a conference where you're meeting up with people that are doctors researchers are doing the latest research in low carbohydrate um and and therapeutic ketogenic 
treatments for different diseases. And if I would tell most people that, Hey, I'm going to this conference, we're going to talk about nutrition. I think people would assume that you're going to go and talk about nutrition. And the only thing you're going to talk about is weight loss. And it's like this whole weekend, I was in San Diego for the symposium for metabolic health. And like, it's, it's such a side thing. It's like the thing that people forget about, like, yes, we talk about weight loss. Yes. We talk about yeah. reversing obesity. Yes. Your body get, composition will improve, but that's, that's not even the good stuff. Like what you're telling me, like mental energy and you can remember things and you feel like there's so many more things that this diet can do. It's so powerful. Yeah. It, it, if anything, the, the weight loss is just a side benefit. Yep. It's, it's the, all the other things that, um, yeah, that it can do. Um, and, and it's hard to explain to people that haven't gone through that process, but when you do go through that process, it has such a profound effect on you. And, um, yeah, you just want to help guide people to just at least give it a go and find out for themselves. Cause when they, when they find it, then yeah, just being able to kind of raise that, that level for people of, of optimization is, is a great place to be. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. I, I will concede that since I've been, you know, on the carnivore diet for five and a half years now, if I do something very highly glycolytic, like play ice hockey, I may have lost the, the, the top like three to 5% of actual like performance. And so I might not do a shift as long as I normally would have five years ago. But again, what you're describing, like performance can increase on this diet. Um, you may notice some things might be a little bit different, but then you just listed off all these other things. And it's like, is it worth it for somebody to maybe, 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 maybe at the very highest level of percentage, you could either, you know, do some targeted carbohydrate therapy to give yourself that top end energy, or you could sacrifice that and continue to experience freedom from sugar cravings and, and sugar addiction. And, you know, the, the mood stabilization, like you said, like that's the primary driver of why I eat the way that I eat is I don't have anxiety when I'm like this. If I eat the other way, I get anxious. It, it's yeah. uncomfortable. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. A hundred percent agree. Um, yeah. And I think that's the question for professional athletes is I w- are we looking to, for their ultimate performance or are we looking at their long-term health? And, and at some points there, there's got to be a, a, a balance to that. And, um, and, and like with any, I think there's probably is a sweet spot that can be found uh, on that way. Like, and like you've mentioned, just cycling in um, carbohydrates and, and th- there's been many top, top athletes at the at the real elite level that are, are following a low carb diet and they and they find what how many carbohydrates they need just to you know maintain their performance and it's still very low carb yep. um and it doesn't have and it's certainly not to the levels that uh, are advocated uh, for a high carb diet that's for sure yeah um and and what are the future benefits by you know optimizing your nutrition that way uh, yeah, i would say that they're, they're vast that's the thing. So, so as part of my career before I was working for a bigger gym and I was doing metabolic testing. So, so testing people on their resting metabolic rate, their fat burn oxidations, VO2 testing. And, and I got the opportunity to test some of the athletes here at our professional soccer club, Real Salt Lake. It's definitely not Manchester United, but a high level MLS team here, the yep. highest level in the United States. And these, these guys you're testing and their metabolic rates are crap. They're not burning a lot of calories. It's very very carbohydrate centric. They're, they're just burning a lot of sugar. And I'm hearing what these guys are eating. And it's like 23 year olds having cold cereal and orange juice and all the pasta and crackers and everything that you already mentioned that was part of your diet. And the thing I'm thinking for like, you know, again, this was a while ago that I tested this guy, but the dude's 23. And I'm just thinking like, what kind of longevity do you want to have in the sport? Like, yes, we need the, the, the physical strength and we need to do the things for strength training. But also it's like you mentioned, like what we know about carbohydrates and sugar in the joints. Like, I don't know what ended up happening with this guy in his career, but like, if you wanted to have any kind of longevity as playing as a soccer player, you're not going to thrive by eating truckloads of sugar that you're, it's going to break down your body. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look at the nutrient quality of that. It's just horrendous. There's no nutrient quality to those types of foods, really. Um, and and then we wonder why the body, you know, breaks down. It will do yeah. because it's not getting what it needs. Um, it makes total logical sense. You know, there's there's essential nutrients there for a reason. 
they're needed the body needs them so you know we should be supporting the body with those essential nutrients not the not the non-essentials totally even just like a bit of protein like it would have been helpful to this guy like yeah so (laughs) um so so for the people that um they're they're athletic they're into athletics they they, they're training this way but they already know that the sports that they play demand carbohydrate energy they demand a very high amount of glucose to be able to do how do you explain to them what things can change when we start to shift the diet away from carbohydrate based to more of fat based um so the first thing that i would do is is actually test them to to give them an idea whether they can deal with carbohydrates or not you know whether they're they're glucose tolerant or not now if they're glucose tolerant then then maybe they can get away with that diet and it not to have um detrimental effect but you know we know from studies that have been done in very recently um i think philip prince and tim noakes was part of that they measured um middle distance runners and and three out of the ten we're in a pre-diabetic state. So unless we test, we don't know. So I think that should definitely be part of um, the guidance for, for an athlete. Um, and, and that's just not, not done. And that could be part of their, um, their health assessments that they have on a, on a season basis, just to kind of, then individualize the diet for those players or athletes, whatever sport it is that may need to make or or put in alternatives to uh, what they would majorly eat across the week and in readiness for, for, for competition. So I think that that's, that's the, that's the best lead in to have that conversation because then you've got something to kind of showcase of, this is the effect this is what we can see and this is the effect if if you don't make some changes to your diet and this is going to benefit you in your performance because you're just going to turn over energy a lot better and also it's going to improve your long-term health so the there's a a great benefit to performance and long-term health that it is is a great motivator or would be a great motivator to to that individual to look at that alternative and make and make that change. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, that that was really well explained. For the listener, in the introduction, we said that you are an expert in periodization. And so just to kind of explain that, periodization is where we are taking a, a plan, a program, and we're not necessarily giving you the same thing you know, every day, every week, unless you're kind of in a maintenance phase, a periodization is where you're changing the program based on somebody's, um, like a macro cycle. Like if somebody has a year long, usually they have a season or something they're playing, yep. you might be training for a triathlon that happens generally in the summertime and not the wintertime. There's different phases and different things are called for at different ways in different parts of the season. And I like to think about that with nutrition as well as the, the physical side of things also, you know, we tend to, to only talk about it, you know, doing personal training as like the training program, but also we can do the same thing, um, with the diet inside somebody's season. So somebody is in the middle of their season or heading towards the end of their season where they've got like a championship coming up. Can you explain why that may or may not be the best time to make some of these alterations that you're talking about and what might be a better alternative? Yeah, definitely. Because there, cause there's kind of a transition of energy fuel, and that, and that can take some time, then, yeah, you certainly wouldn't be doing it close to competition. Um, you would want to do that in a pre-season time where, or, at, or off-season period where you've got that, that time to make that transition and get efficient at that, that alternative fuel burning source. So if you are used to burning sugar, then you're going to be very efficient at that. If you then start to ask the, the body to um, to oxidize fat for your fuel then you're not going to be very efficient at that straight away and it's going to take some transition time to do that so in your off season that's going to be your best time to maybe look at making those changes and then finding out for your pre-season time how you feel and then finding out where your carbohydrate level needs to be for you as an individual and that could still be pretty low if you're not seeing any change a detrimental change to your performance and actually performance going up, then carry on doing what you're doing. 
because it's working for you. Yep. If you feel that it's it's dropped off a little bit, you might need to find where your level of carbohydrates needs to be. Yep. Um, like but again, that. you can come back to the testing and just check that that's not having uh, a detrimental effect to your health by the amount mm. of carbohydrates. So again, you've got that performance and health uh, question to ask yourself. Yep. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. If I were a professional athlete, I would be doing targeted carbohydrate, you know, intake around my event, whatever I would be doing. Um, yep. I would definitely add that in, but since again, I'm, I'm more concerned with overall health, that's not really something I have to do. Um, and do you, do you notice again, whether somebody or not is, is, you know, introducing more carbohydrate or not, most people, again, like you said, can, can still have a fairly decent amount of carbohydrate, but still be considered low carbohydrate. Maybe that's a hundred grams a day. Yep. You know, you're, you're using energy so you can be way more tolerant of that type of energy, whatever the level is for somebody. Do you notice that they really just don't seem to have that much of a drop off in performance? Yeah, absolutely. And, and in most cases, nearly all, they have a, a complete improvement in performance. Oh, and on top of that, going back to the things that, We've said less anxiety, mood states better, sleep better, all these things that you want around your um, recovery uh, and an improvement in performance, they all go up. So it, it, it's all of a greater benefit by making those, those changes. So, so th that's what we see anyway. So glad you said that. It's amazing how... I'm sure you've experienced this too, the recovery part of things. You can have these really hard workouts and feel like, oh man, I really did myself in this time. Like I'm going to be quite sore tomorrow. And you're right. Your sleep gets really efficient and you may get by with a little bit less sleep, but still feel very rested. And you wake up the next day and it's like, you hardly did anything. You you're, feel really good. You're ready to go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Really many, many times over. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So on the training side of things, we hear this all the time that you can't build muscle without carbohydrate. Tell us a little bit about, um, you know, that kind of idea, why people think we need carbohydrate and, and in your experience, is that statement true or not? Um, no, it's not, it's not true in my experience. Um, we've got many clients that are very low carb, got elderly clients that are putting on weight because they're, eating a species appropriate diet as, um, as kind of gets banded around, but go back to those essential nutrients. You give the body what it needs. It, you'll get the adaptation to, to, um, the imposed demands, um, and, and particularly kind of building muscle Well, proteins absolutely needed. Um, and you get that breakdown, uh, of protein into glucose. So is that enough of a response to, still provide what's needed for that adaptation from what i've seen yes so um yeah I, I i don't think that you can uh not build muscle being on a low low carbohydrate diet and, and protein is very much a priority of, of of that diet so yeah you're supporting the the muscles development yeah that, that's an excellent point about the weight stabilization. I've certainly noticed that with a lot of my clients and I, I, we've got data now, you know, researchers out there that are studying ketogenic diets, targeted, you know, therapeutic ketogenic diets on people with anorexia nervosa and where some people we can reverse obesity, other people, it, it, the same diet makes them gain weight. It just seems that people end up at exactly the right kind of weight and body fat percentage that yep. they need. It's, it's quite incredible. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Exactly where they, where they should be. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Wow. And, the, and, and it, it kind of makes sense because the, the body's always searching for homeostasis, always searching for, to be in balance. And, um, if, if there's a stress, it's always trying to find a way to, to not be in that stress and, and find that balance. So that, that kind of makes logical sense for me. Yeah. Gotcha. That's one thing to work with an adult on changing their diet. Somebody who is, you know, open to this, especially somebody that is, is choosing to work with you when it comes to kids, the kids that you work with, I think this would be a very big challenge because knowing what both you and I know about nutrition, like absolutely we want at the very least some of these kids eating lots of protein, a decent amount of fat, let's feed their bodies and feed their brains and give them really good energy. But that is a challenge because these kids are not necessarily the ones that are buying their own food. They go to school, they're fed all the crap yeah. that we see kids in our countries yeah. these days. 
how has how challenging has that been to, for you to kind of work around? What things have you done um, to be successful in helping these kids understand some nutrition basics? Okay, uh, this is an ongoing journey for me. Um, I'm not sure that I'm there yet. My my initial um, uh, experience with it was obviously because I worked in a school and I looked around every day, looked at what was being served in school, um, and I ended up not ever heading up to the canteen because I couldn't look at it anymore, what we were actually serving our children in school. So I contacted Tim Noakes and I said that I would like to, for our athlete, athlete development program, I'd like him to, you know, maybe do a talk um, as an inspirational talk of around kind of real food. Uh, so he did that for me. He was very kind to put a lecture together and we sent it out to parents first that they, if they would like to share it with their children. And then what we'd like to do is we'd like to invite parents in with the children and with um, Professor Tim Noakes on a live link question and answer so that they could come with any questions that they've got. Because we knew that, or I knew, that it was going to be very different to the information that we've that they've ever been kind of presented to them um, before now. Uh, and it got pushed back by a couple of parents, one being a dietitian um, and one being uh, a physiotherapist, um, just kind of really saying that, you know, parents wouldn't be able to understand the literature and that this is just uh, a very um restrictive diet and the the usual stuff that kind of comes out about kind of low carb diet so that kind of lit a fire in me i knew that that wasn't going to be something that i was going to be able to do and and fortunately enough as part of the public health collaboration here there's a um children's arm of that called the cfk collaboration for kids so I'm now on a uh, on the advisory board with um, so from the physical development side, but also there's Peter Ballastead on there, and there's Jen Unwin, there is Campbell Murdoch, who's a low carb GP here that you may have come across. Um, there is Heidi Gaiva, who's a, a nutritionist with um, that works very closely with Jen Unwin, that's kind of leading this this advisory group. And um, there is Trudy Deacon, who um, also runs the expert program that's been really successful in the NHS uh, on diabetes remission through uh, nutritional intervention, low carb use. Okay. So that, I think, is probably the only way that we can start to really get the message out about real food is working with children in school and educating them about what real food is and that's really the the start basis of, of what real food is why it's important what essential nutrients are why you need them and then start to build from the ground up and then those children educating the parents and then can we start to then get the children to educate the parents and and get the parents to start to get on board of right or i'm gonna if this is what you want to do then Let's help you. I love that. I just, the way, the way you said, you know, the parents are pushing back or they like, don't give the parents any credit. Like, oh, the parents aren't going to understand the research. Like we're just going to say everybody's just an idiot and they're not going to be able to comprehend yeah. this stuff. And so we're just going to give up. We're not even going to try. Yeah. And it's like, you and I learned this stuff. <laughs> You're a parent. Like yeah. you, yeah. you, you can learn, you can learn this stuff. I love the idea of giving the information to the kids I can't tell you how many times I talk to parents or the kids themselves that it, it's difficult at first. They love the sugar, but once they get past it, they yeah. really prefer not being on the sugar. They feel better. Their concentration is better. Their sports performance is better. And they yeah. prefer to kind of stay that way. Yeah. And they really pick up the sugariness in, in foods when they have yeah. it. 
and it, and it turns them off. And that just kind of shows that if you're able to kind of just take a step back for a little bit of time of how kind of under that spell you can be when you're so used to it. But then when you, when you're, when you haven't had it for a while, you can really kind of pick up what's in, in a lot of our foods. And um, yeah, it, it, it really highlights to you that it's a big problem in our food supply right yeah, now. Yeah. I love that. I just, I don't think we give parents enough credit and we don't give kids enough credit. Kids are smart and they figure things out. <laughs> they're, they're human too. <laughs> they're really smart. And they also can feel very hard done by as well. So when they understand the truth, they, yeah, they get, they can get quite annoyed about it. So, um, good <laughs> and understandably so as well. And so, yeah. They, yeah, and like I say, so they should. Good. Yeah, exactly. I hope they get a little bit of the anger that you had as well that mm. I had when you start to learn about this. Stuff. <laughs> yeah. That's great. How are you working with people today? So my main, uh, right. So where, where I'm at over the last five years. So when I, when I started to learn ab about this and wanted to kind of really help people initially, I, would say to them, right, I need you to go and get some blood tests so you, I know, we know where you're starting from. So what we found is they go to their GP, ask for them blood tests, and they'd be like, what do you need that for? You don't need that. So we were coming up against the barrier of knowing where someone started. And because I'd learned about um, insulin resistance and around kind of um, – doing glucose measurements i really wanted to have that information um and i wanted it for myself and i came across luckily in the pandemic there was a um a, a podcast by Eva cummins that was discussing about um uh, insulin testing and i was like this is brilliant i've potentially found something that I can actually test what I'm finding out about. So I contacted um, Ivor Cummins show because there was a link that you could go through and they were doing like a test project. And, uh, and originally they had a, um, they had something called a, a shooting box. So you, you had like a lateral flow and you put it in the shooting box and you could take, you put your phone on top and then the phone by taking a picture of the lateral flow it would take a reading through the phone so you would get a reading. That was the first kind of prototype of hmm. that tool, that device to be able to do that. Now, as it's developed over the last five years, is that we have a, a desktop that's got all of that inside the desktop that does that reading. So you've got a machine that, was, that can, can read the insulin measurement. So we can now provide people with an oral glucose tolerance test with insulin to replicate what Dr. Joseph Kraft did in the seventies and highlight for people that your glucose can be normal fasted, but also in that oral glucose tolerance test, it can stay within normal range, but your insulin can be way, way above markers, both in peak, but also in terms of its, its return back to baseline. And we've seen that countless times now. So by having the opportunity to be able to provide that real deep understanding and knowledge of metabolism for someone, we've, we've got a great place to start to showcase one, why eating carbohydrates for this individual is a problem. Mm. And then two, we can measure the changes so that they can visually see it in front of them. So they've got all the benefits that, that we've spoken about in our talk tonight but wow. also they can see the real improvements in the in the blood markers as well and we'll do their lipids as well um the hba1c alongside that and so we have a kind of real round of uh view of what i wanted to do five years ago and now i can do that myself that's amazing and then i can provide that information for them so that's wow. where i feel like i can really uh help people with really informed information about where their health's at and how it's improving over time. Wow. That's got to be very powerful for uh, the client to be able to see that. That's wonderful. 
Um, and mm. then I don't have this in front of me. I really should. But did I see on your social media that you've got a, an event coming up? Oh, yes. Yeah. What, um, so so my, my wife um, is a clinical Pilates uh, instructor um, as, as part of one of the services that, that we do. And obviously the strength development work that I do and we've got the health testing. So what we wanted to, to um, put on is a, is a wellness immersion weekend. So there's going to be education about real food, low carbohydrates, eating at local restaurants and choosing from a menu, how I would choose from a menu uh, and making certain choices. We'll, we'll do the health tests in, uh, in the morning of the weekend. We live in a, in a beautiful part of Devon. It's an area of outstanding natural beauty right by the coast. So we're going to get out and and have a coastal walk and we've got beautiful woodland near us and there's beautiful walks um through there so and then the clinical pilates and then how to kind of build strength into your lifestyle so that we can provide people with tools that they can go away with and information about their their health and reconnect with their health that's that's what what we want to essentially put on is is give the give people an opportunity to, to come reconnect with their health, get them out of their, uh, their environment for a weekend and really kind of get some understanding and, and get some really good tools to take away with them that they can put into their lifestyle. So, um, yeah, that's what we're, we're hoping to put on. That sounds lovely and sounds amazing. And I'm a little bit disappointed that you're doing it where you are. You're describing it. I'm like, Oh great. He's going to load this all up in a plane fly to the United <laughs> States, come here in the Salt Lake Valley and do this for me. I would, here, I would love great. that. <laughs> <laughs> so would I. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds amazing. What is, do you know the date on that? Yeah. So it's, uh, is the 20th. So Friday, the 20th of September to the 22nd. Okay. So Friday, great. Saturday, Sunday. Excellent. We'll be sure to get this episode out and launched before that. So people can know about that. If they're in your neck of the woods, they can go and sign up for that. We'll also make sure that we have a link for that. Um, Andy, this has been an awesome Amazing. conversation. I feel like I could talk to you for hours. This has been really, really fun. Told some great stories and a lot of really great information that's helping a lot of people out there. I always love to find people that can marry you know, kind of the, the physical training with also nutrition and understand that all of it fits into what we can use to help people along with all the modalities of recovery and all that other stuff you mentioned. So this has been a great conversation. I've really appreciated your time. Where would you like people to go to find you and connect with you in your work? And then again, we'll have a link underneath, but where would you like people to go to find out about the weekend retreat? Um, so they can find out about that through uh, our social media channels is probably the best because we've, we've got a lot of posting uh, around that and um, people can find me at Andy Taylor on Facebook or they can find us on LinkedIn which is tailormade underscore performance underscore rehabilitation or they can find me on LinkedIn as well so um, just Andy Taylor and they'll they'll find me on there and um, there was one other thing actually that we um that we are with Metabolic, my partner company, through the insulin testing, we are looking at or we've been trying to set up a uh, project with the um, Nutrition Network, with the Noakes Foundation, um, particularly looking at assessing insulin resistance in health conscious individuals to, to see what the prevalence of that is. And using the the craft test to be able to uh, to assess that um, and find the earliest possible marker um, of of that. Um, so if if anyone's um, knows anyone in terms of kind of funding that might be able to help in terms of funding for a project like that, that we really appreciate appreciate that in terms of the research that can, goes into putting on a project like that. That sounds amazing. And no better person than Professor Noakes to be able to do that, having been a former yeah. athlete and, and pre-diabetic himself. So that's Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, that's awesome. We will link all of that in the show notes. Andy, again, thank you so very amazing. much for all of your information today. This is a fun chat. And thank you for taking time to be on our show today. We really appreciate you. Thank you, Casey. I've I really enjoyed it. So uh, yeah, thanks again for having me on. It's great to talk to you. Uh, it was great to talk to you as well. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio.